measurement section of a typical displacer type level transmitter consists of a displacer, usually a hollow stainless steel cylinder, a displacer rod and driver, and the driver bearing. The knife edge bearing eliminates friction and assures a positive center of rotation for the displacer and torque tube. A female socket on the torque tube fits over the displacer rod driver. The torque tube assembly provides the means for transmitting the motion from the displacer to the control mechanisms. The torque tube assembly consists of the torsional spring which twists with displacer movement and a rotary shaft which also twists with the torque tube. The shaft is welded inside the tube. The use of the torque tube provides a frictionless pressure seal and the means for transmitting the displacer motion outside the displacer chamber or process vessel. The actual length that the displacer travels for the full range of the level measurement is approximately three-eighths of an inch. A typical displacer, such as that found in a Fisher level troll, has a displacement of 100 cubic inches. It can withstand over 1,000 psi pressure. The normal weight is 4.75 pounds. The typical Fisher level troll displacer operates in specific gravity ranges of 0 0.1 to 1.2. The displacer always pulls down. The torsional force from the torque tube always pulls up. And the buoyant force of the fluid displaced pushes up. When the forces are combined, the weight of the displacer has to be the greatest force even when the displacer is fully submerged. However, when the displacer chamber is dry, the displacer is suspended by the torsional force of the torque tube. Due to the fact the displacer must always pull down, 1.2 specific gravity material is the heaviest material we can measure with the standard displacer and achieve satisfactory results. If the gravity is heavier than 1.2, the displacer will not sink. What happens to the rotary motion transmitted outside the flow chamber? The rotary motion is converted to a proportional signal, either electric or pneumatic. Conversion of this rotary motion to an electronic signal will be studied in a later module. The displacer and torque tube assemblies are the same for pneumatic and electronic transmitters. We are concerned with conversion of rotary shaft motion to a pneumatic signal in this lesson. One way to detect the rotary motion is to fasten a flapper to the rotary shaft. And as the level moves, the rotary shaft twists, and the flapper covers or uncovers the nozzle. If we add a relay, we have a pneumatic level transmitter. This is a very impractical transmitter. It has no zero or specific gravity adjustments. If we add an alignment screw, which is actually a coarse zero adjustment, we can adjust the flapper position and vary the output to correspond to the level.
would have to make such an adjustment if the level was 50%, but the transmitter output was 25%. We could also change the output by raising and lowering the nozzle assembly. This could be done with an eccentric cam and a pivoted bar fastened to the nozzle. This adjustment is called the fine zero adjustment. The two adjustments do the same thing. The fine zero adjustment is used to make small changes. If you need all the fine zero adjustment to produce the necessary output change, you can use the alignment screw to bring the zero adjustment back in range. This is a typical zero adjustment. This is the alignment screw. Now work exercise one in your workbook. Maybe we have a workable transmitter. Let's assume that 0 to 14 inches of water in the displacer chamber produces 3 to 15 psi output with this transmitter. What can we do to make the transmitter give us 3 to 15 psi output for 0 to 14 inches of gasoline, which has a specific gravity of 0.5? The flapper movement produced by the 0 to 14 inch level of gasoline would be half that produced by the 0 to 14 inches of water, since the specific gravity of gasoline is 0 0.5, and the 0 0.5 specific gravity will buoy the displacer up only half the amount the water does. We must have some way to compensate for the differences in total flapper movement due to the different specific gravity materials that can be measured. We can compensate for differences in flapper movement by moving the nozzle horizontally to or from the rotary shaft. This adjustment is a course zero adjustment. This adjustment is accomplished by loosening these two screws and repositioning the level set arm. During calibration, this adjustment is made on a trial and error basis until the correct output span is obtained. By loosening the mounting screws and sliding the level set arm to the left, the device will produce more pneumatic output span for a given level change. The nozzle will be further from the rotary shaft. If you slide the level set arm to the right, the device will produce less output span for a given level change. The nozzle will be closer to the rotary shaft. We can also compensate for the differences in flapper movements by moving the nozzle vertically to or from the flapper. This is not the same as the zero adjustment. Let's examine the construction of the nozzle and Borden tube to see how this is done. The nozzle pressure is conveyed from the nozzle tip to the relay by means of a small tube inside the Borden tube. If we apply a pressure to the Borden tube, it will try to straighten. This will move it farther from the nozzle. Where do we get the pressure to move the Borden tube? It comes from the output of the relay and is called feedback. Feedback is a portion of the output signal used to balance the input signal. This particular feedback is called negative feedback because it opposes or counteracts the input signal. Negative feedback can be called sensitivity reduction 
because when you have more negative feedback, you have less sensitivity. How do we regulate the feedback signal? The installation of a three-way valve will serve the purpose. A portion of the output can be routed through the three-way valve and to the Borton tube. The output signal goes in the three-way valve. The output can be blocked depending on where the knob is set. It can all go to the Borden tube, or it can split, some air going to the Borden tube, and some out the bleed. The three-way valve is the specific gravity adjustment. It is graduated from 0 to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and on up to 1.0 specific gravity. The specific gravity adjustment determines the amount of feedback that enters the Borden tube. For instance, if the specific gravity of the material you are measuring is 0 0.2, you would set the specific gravity dial on 0 0.2. Assuming our level is 0 to 14 inches equals full scale, this means that we want the flapper movement caused by a rise from 0 to 14 inches of 0 0.2 specific gravity material to equal 3 to 15 psi output. The flapper movement will be very small. Therefore, we cannot have much negative feedback pressure to move the nozzle. This means that the output pressure would be virtually blocked from the Borden tube at the specific gravity adjustment valve. The bleed valve would be open. If the fluid is water, the flapper movement will be greater than the previous example. Therefore, there must be more feedback to move the nozzle away from the flapper. The specific gravity adjustment is set on 1.0. The bleed is closed, and the full output goes directly to the Borden tube. The relationship between flapper and nozzle remains the same for a 3 to 15 pound pressure change. If it takes one thousandth of an inch to make a 3 to 15 pound change for 1.0 specific gravity material, It will take one thousandths of an inch to make a 3 to 15 psi change for 0 0.2 specific gravity material. The only difference between the measurement of 0 0.2 and 1.0 specific gravity material is the amount of feedback or sensitivity reduction used to balance the output to the corresponding input. On a rising level, the primary movement, or the rotary motion, covers the nozzle. The feedback tends to uncover the nozzle. The amount of the primary movement is constant, dependent upon the specific gravity of the measured fluid. The feedback signal is a variable. Its action is opposite that of the flapper. If the flapper covers the nozzle, feedback tends to uncover it. And if the flapper uncovers the nozzle, feedback tends to cover it. This primary motion opposed by the feedback occurs whether the level is rising or falling. It occurs at all points through the 3 to 15 psi range. The artwork illustrations have exaggerated the flapper and nozzle relationship for clarity. It should be remembered that the flapper and nozzle relationship for a 3 to 15 psi change is in the magnitude of thousandths of an inch. The movement of the feedback Borden tube is also very small. We now have a complete transmitter. 
It has a coarse span adjustment, a fine span or specific gravity adjustment. The transmitter has a coarse zero adjustment or alignment screw, and it has a fine zero adjustment. Now work exercise two in your workbook.